Thank you very much. <clears throat> and let me say, uh, I'm sure my brother uh, Indar would have done an excellent job at positioning exactly what we're doing in the region. I've had a full brief on everything that transpired so far. Um, before I get into uh, what we are doing in Guyana and how we see this evolving, I think there are some important elements that we must address given the theme of your, uh, your discussion this morning. I'm very pleased also that we have the FAO, we have technical people, we have uh, people in academia, practical persons and persons in policy making as part of this discourse. I think it gives us an opportunity to have a broad um, and enabling discussion, one that is not uh, skewed in a particular direction, but one that looks at the comprehensive nature of this problem. It, it is a problem. First of all, we have to recognize that we have a problem. Now, your, your theme of your uh, discourse around a few very important subjects. One, sufficiency, food sufficiency. Two, the resilience, uh, economic growth, and development. So now, the, many times when we look at agriculture from the developing world, especially from small island development states, we look at agriculture as something that has to be uh, subsidized as something that cannot be dealt with within a, within a model, uh, within a development model. This is something that we have to change. We have to look at the entire agricultural system and, and change it and to look at, at what we need to develop. And what we are trying to develop in the region is a food development, uh, a food development and production system itself a food development and production system itself. In that food uh, development and production um, system, there are a number of things that we must address and things that we are addressing in the region. Looking at where we want agriculture to be and the system to be in the future, we have to look at well, how do we involve women. These are important issues. How do we get women involved in agriculture? What systems we need to change? What do we need to add? in the whole agricultural system to have more women participation? How do we ensure that more women are leading farms using science and technology as aid in helping women to lead farms? Young people, we cannot build an agricultural system or a production system that does not have the future in mind. What we have now is a lot of young persons not going to agriculture. The question is why? Because we still promote agriculture as in the traditional way agriculture has been promoted over the years. This is not going to be attractive to young people. So what we have done is to pursue a strategy that is attractive to women and young people, bringing them uh, into the food production system using technology, uh, research and development. So now you have persons who are graduates from ag agriculture instead of wanting to go at a desk job or in an in a, in a, uh, office environment, they are now willing to look at the production aspect and leading farms and becoming entrepreneurs. Most of the agricultural program does not have a strong focus on entrepreneurial development. And then uh, how do we add the technology into that? So that women, youth, climate. We cannot speak about, about agriculture development or food production development or a system if we don't acknowledge that we live in a region that has severe climatic uh, uh, effects and conditions that is as a result of climate change, much of which we will not be able to change. So we have to build a system that is, res that is resilient, that is sustainable. So that tells us that this system we are building must incorporate the best technology, must make use of, uh, of the research and development that helps the system we are building for, for the future to be resilient. And there is enough technology available today for us. The second thing is that there is great competition for land in the region and land use. You can have the same level of production on less land if you use the appropriate technology, if you use the, the, appropriate, uh, the appropriate systems that are out there. So when we speak about resilience and sustainability, the system must be built on a backbone that allows for this. Infrastructure. Now, uh, the, the third issue here is the infrastructure that we have. 
Years ago, we had to build 10 miles of road to open up 10,000 acres of land. Today, you can take three acres of land, develop world-class infrastructure, put a, hydro a hydroponic system in there that may give you the same production in high-value crop in terms, of, uh, in terms of value, financial value to the crop. And that is something that we're looking at. How do we address import substitution by using technology and giving the people what they're accustomed to, but producing it locally? Yes, the capital cost is going to be high, but the long-term benefit and, the, and targeting high-value crop is very important. So that's another thing that we have to look at, the infrastructure that has to be built. Barbados, for example, uh, we are looking at Barbados now, uh, Prime Minister Motley and, and Indar, they're working now on a system as to how they will uh, capitalize on existing infrastructure that they're building to support agriculture and other sectors like the water reservoirs. How can we convert it and add aquaculture to that? And a lot of work is being done and this type of partnership. If the Caribbean believe that we can do this singularly, we are fooling ourselves. This requires partnership and a willingness of all stakeholders to work in a cohesive manner. Utilizing each other competitive advantage uh, and, and pushing each other competitive advantage to the benefit of the region. That is why what we are doing, we are also integrating with the state of Roraima because they have great uh, 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 advances in research and development in the use of technology. So hydroponics, shade house, uh, aquaculture. You, if we move from a production of zero, of zero, in prawns, for example, in Barbados, to 10,000 pounds in the initial phase, and you have young persons and women being part of that, it is an important development and economic transformation that will take place. So this is, this is what is linked to the development aspect and the economic uh, transformation that we speak about. In Guyana, because we're doing a lot of mega farms, we're focusing on high production using mega farms, looking at new crops, for example, experimenting with wheat, becoming self-sufficient in corn and soya by 2025, and after that being in a position to export to the rest of the region. It requires tremendous investment in drainage and irrigation. As you know, we are below sea level. So the application of research, technology, women, access to financing, we have been able to lead a process in the region where we were able to work with the private sector the, the, in Republic Bank in having 100 million US dollars ready from a commercial bank at low interest to help in the access to financing. Because access to financing is a critical part of the whole system that we want to build. Now, what is the situation? Will the situation get better? How are we going to address uh, this? We cannot, we cannot ignore the fact that we are operating in a global environment. Is the global environment going to get better? Absolutely not. The global food import bill uh, uh, is, is uh, the trajectory is a whopping $1.8 trillion. $1.8 trillion US dollars. But guess what? Guess what is more frightening? The global food import bill is projected to rise by $51 billion from 2021. An already high figure in 2021. But out of that $51 billion rise, $49 billion is an account of higher prices. And this is according to the FAO. I see my friend from the FAO is here. $49 billion of the $51 billion is as an account of higher prices. Not increased production, nothing to do with self-sufficiency, is on account of prices alone. So that tells us, that alone tells us that we have to push back into self-sufficiency. That every single state must get involved and integrated in the production of food. That we have to set the parameters and the fundamental right, the fundamentals right to push production. 
And that is what Guyana and Barbados, we are trying to push and to demonstrate to small island states, uh, that, and especially in CARICOM, that if we put the right effort and we integrate and we solve problems together, we can solve this as a community. Now, if you look <clears throat> as of June 2022, the number of acute food insecure people increased to 345 million in 82 countries. 345 million in 82 countries. But out of that, 2.8 million people, or nearly 40% of the population in the English-speaking Caribbean, are food insecure. Sometimes, if you look at the media, you'll believe that our region is food rich because the, the media or the headlines do not demonstrate this problem, that 40% of the people in the English-speaking Caribbean are food insecure. We have never seen a headline like this. But this is a major issue. Now, if we are to contrast that with North America, in North America, which is right our, our, our neighbor, 89.5% of US households were food secure. Imagine we are living in a region where, as we know, one of our most important strategic partner, the US is just next door, they're 89.5% food secure. We're living in a region, in the English-speaking Caribbean, where 40% of our people are food insecure. This brings in the question of inequality, disparity. And we have to be willing to address all of this in a holistic conversation on this topic. The FAO raised its forecast for world wheat production from its last report in July the 777 million tons, which is still a drop from 2021. And we know the consequences of a shortage and price increases and weak consequences that this issue will bring on us. Now, as of August 2022, at least 23 countries have implemented 33 food export bans and at least seven have implemented 11 export limiting measures. What are we doing about this? Whilst the world is faced with this situation, 23 countries have implemented 33 export, food export bans, and seven have implemented 11 export limiting measures, including India with rice. All of this is making the global situation more complex and complicated. That has an effect on small island developing states and countries like ours. Especially in a situation where CARICOM imports more than 60% of all that we eat. And in some countries, more than 80% of all the food that is consumed locally. Imagine that is the situation in this global context, what are we going to do? There is need for short and long-term responses to boost food production and nutrition, improve food security, reduce risk, and strengthen food system. The global, regional, and national food system must become more responsive to the needs of the population. The system has to be responsive to the needs of the population to give them healthy and affordable diets, inclusive food sustainable uh, subs uh, sustenance, and affords good livelihood for all, especially small economies. We have to look at agricultural investment as an essential part of what we do in the national budget. In the Caribbean, we have set a target on what the national budget should be for agriculture and food production if we are to achieve the target of 25 by 2025, that is reducing our food import bill by 25% by 2025. Among countries with the highest share of agriculture in government expenditure between 2016 and 2020, 
Many belong to the least developed countries. I want to make this point. Because sometimes we believe that the least developed countries don't focus enough on agriculture. But the fact is, the top countries are led by uh, Malawi, 11.8%, Bhutan, 11.7%, Mali, 11.6%, China, 9.6%, Guyana, 8.7%, India, 7.6%, Nepal, 7.1%, Central Africa, the Central uh, African Republic, 6.6%, and Thailand, 6.3%. If we are to achieve the targets that we set in the region, and if small, small developing states are to ensure they develop and build enough systems that, that, that is robust in keeping with this theme that you have, we have to all ensure that our national budget, our expenditure in the national budget for agriculture and food production must be at least 7.5%. It must be at least 7.5% at the minimum. This is what is required for us even to scratch the surface of the problem in the, soft, in the short term. And the development agencies, the funding agencies, need to also restructure their financing to reflect this. In a world in which we are lagging behind, on the fallout in education and learning as a result of COVID, it becomes more complicated because there is greater competition for financing. But let's look at what just took place at the UN. Did, did we actually realize what took place at the UN? For the first time, the macro issue was food security. Climate change and everything else fell under the umbrella of food security. Every single address at the UN, every single side event had the issue of food security. We have, for once, we have gathered the attention of the world, of every single leader, of every single organization. We have never had a better opportunity at addressing this issue than now. The UNSG himself pointed to the complexity of this problem. This is a time for small developing states, all of us, to push hard, to push the funding agency, work with FAO on pushing our agenda, bringing the private sector in. If we can't do it now, then we will be in serious problems in the long term, long run. No, I, I know I've already exceeded uh, my time that was allocated to me, and I, I have a lot more to say. I have not even touched what the guy has prepared for me as yet, but I'm very passionate on this issue. I, I believe for too long we have been passive, and we have allowed this issue to grow into a major problem, but we cannot address this if we don't address it systemically. I can speak for the next hour on the trade barriers. That must be removed. This is our opportunity to address it. How do we harmonize our, how do we harmonize our standard system, the standardization of produce?